come on. Are you, Mr. Marshall? Am I what? Seeing the attendees come into the house. Okay, there's one. There's yeah. Johanna. There's Johanna. And I see Amherst Media, so it looks like we have one attendee. Um, and that is Amherst Media. So we are good to go. All right. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of November 17th, 2021. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media, and minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town's website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the room, the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive rec record of proce proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Jack Jemsek. Here. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. And I, Doug Marshall, are also present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to, to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to mute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate your wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right. So the first item on our agenda this evening uh, is uh, approval of minutes. We have two sets of minutes tonight. The first one is from May 12th, 2021. So do I have anybody who would be willing to uh, make a motion to approve these minutes? I see Andrew's hand. So moved. Thank you, Andrew. Second. Uh, I think I heard a second from Janet. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, are there any discussion, any rec requests for edits to these minutes? Seeing none, why don't we go ahead and have a roll call vote for these minutes? All right. First, Maria. Approve. And Jack. Approve. Uh, Tom Long. Approve. Andrew McDougall. Aye. Janet McGowan. Approve. And Johanna Newman. Approve. And I also approve. Uh, 
So the second set of minutes is from November 3rd, 2021. And I have a motion to approve those minutes. Uh, Johanna. I move to approve the minutes from November 3rd. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you, Tom. Any discussion? I do. Janet? Um, I, I was confused by these minutes um, when we got to the old business talking about um, the parking access regulation. I wonder if Marie could help me. Um, so like on the page two, it said, you know, Maureen Pollock presentation slides in the packet, which I thought was nice. So people could go look there. And then um, it kept on referring to like where in the packet, but I couldn't tell if you were just like saying, hey, if you wanna see more, it's in the packet, or if you're just saying, go look at the packet, and this is also what she said. If like, like on page three, it says problem statement, page 69, Maureen Pollock's additional comments. So I, I so I, that's my question. Like, okay. all right, Maria, would you be able to answer that? Sure, um, it's what you said, Janet. That. Um, which one of the options? Oh, uh, the that what that line is about is on page um, seventy one of PD packet. And and are the the notes that you have put in the minutes? Mm -hmm. Is that what's on page sixty nine, or is that additional information that came out of the discussion? Uh, it looks like a little of both, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I can't remember now. I wrote these so long ago. Um, let's see. I think, oh, oh, we're right at the top under number three. It says Maureen Pollock's additional comments. So those must be additional comments. So, so the problem I see with that is that it would force somebody who is reading these minutes to kind of go to the packet and go back and forth and see that. And I, I don't think that's going to satisfy what we're supposed to do with our minutes under the state statute, which is just summarize the discussion so somebody who wasn't there could understand it. So I hate to say this, but I just like, I was like, was it more, you know, I need, like, I actually use minutes to go back and things, but I just, I don't think that's going to be enough to say, oh, go look at the packet, you know, which our packets being like 150 pages and say, oh, well, look at that. It's on this page and then come back to it. So someone's going to be going screen to screen and stuff like that. So I understand the efficiency of it, but I don't think it's going to be like sufficient for our legal requirement. <clears throat> So um, it sounds like, uh, Janet, you're suggesting that these minutes really ought to be able to stand on their own as, yeah. a, sing as a single document. Yes. Um, yeah, I understand that. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, what if the reference to just the page number in additional comments is struck? So it's just comments from Maureen. That way it's all self-contained. Would that suffice, Janet, you think, in your opinion? Well, I think we need to have her pre like what she said. And so. So, yeah. So what if, I guess, what if it's just Maureen stated and then the following. And so it's not referenced as additional. That's it's, it is summarizing what she said. Yeah. Um, it's just that I'm just worried that she said a whole bunch of stuff that we isn't here. I mean, I, it sounded like, you know, you know, when you have like, I mean, basically she puts up her thing and then she repeats it and goes through it. And then she puts extra stuff on. I think we're missing the meat of it. Or the reader would be. I, I actually, okay. thank, I thank, actually you, thank you, Janet. Tom, you're the next hand. Sorry. Um, yeah, I actually don't think we can read them that way because from there's no way that Maureen's additional comments would be in our packet. I think um, what we're seeing is that um, Maureen's additional comments are then listed below, um, and the conventional standards are from page 71 of the packet, which is where that information would be located should you want it. Um, but I don't think any comments are in there because comments cannot be in a packet that happened before a meeting. So I think we're confusing the issue on this. So there's no really no way that additional information could be present. So I think the structure is really helpful in terms of showing people where the information that's being discussed might be but I don't think there's any pertinent information from our discussion that's being negated here. All right, thanks, Tom. Maria? Yeah, that, that's basically it. Um, 
everything else that was said would just be me copy pasting page 71 of the TV packet under that, like for example, number three A, I could copy paste that whole page, but I didn't want to reiterate what was in the packet. I'd read instead, I only wrote the one the thing she said that I didn't see already in our packet. So exactly what Tom said, sorry. <laughs> but um yeah, so our conversation happened after this, I think, because this is just her presentation. And yeah, the board discussions later. So uh, whatever she said that wasn't in the packet, I tried to call and put here. So um, so if you want a whole summary, you could literally paste, copy paste pages 70 through 75 as the beginning to this section, because that's the additional information that's missing is literally her slides. Okay, thanks, Maria. I'm going to jump to Chris. Did you want to hand, make a comment? I was going to say we could add the phrase for further information, see page 70 of planning board packet. Or just drop the reference completely. Yeah, that would that would certainly not raise any questions to people that saw the minutes. Tom. Your hand is still up, Tom. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's a legacy hand. OK, uh, Janet. You are muted, Janet. Um, so, so I, I think I'm back with I started. So, Maria, are you saying you captured everything she said, or are you just putting down? You're not putting down what she said that repeated the presentation. You just did her additional comments. I think it's the latter. So, I guess the question, Chris, I is when we have presentations from people. Do we need to essentially summarize or repeat what was in that presentation in the minutes? No. Um, I, mean, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, um, what I often do is, you know, Nate Malloyd made a presentation about blah, blah, blah. And then this is what came afterwards. So I don't think that people need to um, reiterate everything that was in the presentation. Um, okay. I'm so um, Janet? Could I just say what I understand to just clarify it? So Maria, everything you've written down is what, Mar what Mar Maureen said, even if she was just verbally restating her presentation. No, she, if, if she was verbally repeating what was written in the presentation, Maria did not put it in the minutes. Okay, so I think that's what's deficient. Like we have to know what she said. And so I don't think we can expect well, people- Well, I, I, I guess I, I understand your, your comment, um, but certainly what we just heard from Chris was, we can just say M Maureen made a, made a presentation. And that would be all we'd have to say in the minutes, at least according to Chris's kind of understanding of usual practice. And then we would record the discussion about that presentation in the minutes. So, uh, Maria, you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm basically wondering whether you need to just spend another hour and go back and see if there's anything. What I can do is take away all the page references and um, Maureen's presentation, those pages are pretty succinct. They're just bullet points. You know, it's not like, you know, lengthy language. So it would be easy enough just to copy paste all of her bullet points if that's what Janet wants to see as though, literally. Because yeah, I, it's hard to know how much to write, but what I did was just, not repeat what was already available in our packet. So if it's confusing, I can just take away the page numbers of the packet and say, see the planning board packet for a full presentation because it's a pretty, you know, it's pretty succinct. So, um, well, it sounds, I mean, I guess as I look at this, it sounds like, in fact, you've probably included more information than would typically be done. If we just had a line that said, Maureen made a presentation. <laughs> Yeah. You know, oh, the entire third page would go away. That would have been nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, wh whatever I think Chris thinks is the established norm, I'm willing to follow. I, I don't, I, I think I was just typing away that night and didn't really think beyond that. So okay. um, if it's confusing, I can delete all of that. I'd be happy to input number two, Maureen made a presentation, see planning board packet, and then it goes right to, well, the board, know, discussion. board discussion or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just think Chris, that's. I think Chris? that's. I think that's insufficient for our legal requirement. You, we can't expect people to go see, go through our packet to look for the presentation, and I would appreciate just you know the cut and paste. You know, people who read these minutes should know what was discussed, and they wouldn't in that situation. So, another. Chris? I wanted to note that these minutes are nine pages long, and well, actually eight pages long. And the meeting only went until 9.12. So those are pretty hefty minutes for a three hour meeting. And if you look at minutes from other uh, boards and committees in town, they're nothing like this. You know, TAC um, has minimal, they don't even have full sentences. They just have phrases here and there. Um, and I think these minutes are sufficient. And if people are really interested in delving into what was um, presented, they can go and look at the packet. And, and that's often the way we do it. Um, you know, I would say, well, um, Amherst College made a presentation about their signs and there were three signs and they were in these locations. And then um, later on the planning board discussed those signs, but I, we don't, we, we are trying not to write down every single thing that is said. And we've been struggling with that because it's very hard to turn out the minutes as everybody knows, everybody now has participated in writing minutes and it's a real task to do this and to make it correct. And so if we, if we wanna do the minutes in a timely manner and not you know, have another open meeting law complaint filed against us. We're trying to do it in an expedited manner, but also to provide as much information as we can about what the planning board said back and forth about what they were discussing. And I don't really feel like we need to reiterate word for word what was presented to us because that is material that is available to people if they're interested. All right, thank you, Chris. Andrew? So this is one of the reasons why I hate meeting minutes. I, I just wasted like three hours of my life taking some minutes for a CPAC uh, presentation or meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I mean, I, I tend to agree with Jan and I think that it's supposed to capture the content of the presentation. I think I think it can be short though, right? I mean, I think it just, it can be like, honestly, like three sentences even. Maureen presented something that talked about A, B and C. She added, and then you already have that stuff written. Like, I, I don't, I think we've all agreed it, it shouldn't be a transcript, but um, I, I will say that in the, minute, the minutes that I had done and based on my understanding for that recent CPAC one, as well as the planning board ones I had done, I, 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 I shifted towards, or I didn't shift, I, I took the approach of, we're documenting all the things that happened um, as briefly as possible. So. I'll, I'll just put it out there. I think without having any clear direction as to what what the bare minimum of meeting minutes truly is, we're good, we could have this we could have this argument every time. Right. Uh, Jack, you are you are muted, Jack. Yeah, I just want to say you know as long as we have a link. Uh, to the Amherst Media version of uh, of our meeting, I, I think we should be good. Although I would suggest that what I'm seeing in our minutes is just like like a link, but I would probably uh, put you know the 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 physical sort of you know web um, address for the link versus what I see because I, I I see one you know. The one for November 3rd doesn't, it just says November 3rd YouTube. But I think if we actually put the distinct sort of address, you know, there's there's shortcuts or whatever to YouTube. If we put that in there, I think that will be beef it up a little bit. Um, 
that and you know and again well okay thanks jack um one thing that occurs to me would be to you know we're the, the end product of the minutes is often a pdf and um you know if if maureen had five pages of a powerpoint would it make sense to attach that powerpoint to the minutes and then you've got a single document you don't have to go somewhere else to see the you know look on page 70 of the packet um so i'll throw that out there i don't know how difficult that would be for the staff um to just attach the powerpoint presentation chris do you have an opinion about that yeah we have a problem because when we post the minutes we post a pdf and there and the links are not live as far as i know Pam might correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the links are kind of dead links in the PDF and people would have to, um, Type I don't out. know, I don't know how, do they copy that link and then paste it somewhere, Pam? I don't really know. Yeah, Pam? I can't raise my hand, so I'm sorry. That's why I keep doing that. Um, I actually worked with Brianna. We can't hear you, Can Pam. You? I actually worked with Brianna recently and we looked at the links. So the links are live. You can, you, you control click. Oh, okay. um, so Jack, I wanted to say to you, the November 3rd recording in those minutes, you are absolutely right. That is not a link. And that is because the recording is not up on the YouTube channel yet. That's not something I have control over. Um, IT does that pretty quickly. But so as soon as they do, um, I put it into the minutes, the live link. So, so it most often is the live link. Um, and then I feel like there was one third thing that I wanted to say. Oh, so we recently um, started adding a link to the packet at the bottom of, um, at the, bottom of the minutes. And also too, um, I'm not sure if either set of the minutes that are before you tonight, also any additional documents. So if your packet was sent out and then we got three or four more items and we posted that as additional packet documents, those are all listed at the bottom of the minutes now. Um, again, with live links that people should be able to go right to those documents. So. Hopefully those things are all helpful. So those, so you think those live links could, that, that, that my suggestion of actually attaching the, 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 the a PDF of the presentation slides is unnecessary because the link is always going to be good. The link, correct. I mean, um, you know, obviously, I guess the question would be is, would it become redundant? Um, and I okay. guess that would probably be a question for, for Chris. Um, I, I guess my question, Mr. Marshall, would be why would we, if we're putting up entire packets, you know, if we're linking to the entire packet and any additional documents, that would include any presentations that were given. Am, am, I, am I understanding correctly? I don't know who you're asking. You're the one putting them up. Well, so that I'm trying to get you to answer that question because yes, then, then I'm going to say it would be redundant because all of the documents are now attached to the bottom of the minutes. Through the link. Through, through the links, yes. So are, are you asking to actually include like a paper well, product? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether that would solve the problem. Um, you know, uh, if, if the, I mean, there, there's the inconvenience of somebody reading minutes and having to go look at a separate PDF through a link to find the content of the presentation. And then there's the possibility that at some point in the future, that link may not be valid anymore. 
So to have the minutes with the with the presentation as a single document seems like it's more likely to be a complete picture of the minute of the meeting in perpetuity or however long we're really talking about. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I haven't thought much about this question and you guys have been doing minutes forever. Uh, Chris? So why don't we do this for this time? Um, either Pam or I, or both of us will go through the video and we will fill in some summary of what Maureen said um, in all of these instances. And um, we will do that for this set of minutes. And I, and so I'll, I'll just uh, leave it at that. And um, we'll bring it back to you the next time. All right. Okay. And, the all right. and my guess is the minutes are going to be like 15 pages long, but that's, that's okay. Okay. That's what we are looking for. All right. Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, Janet, you are muted. Yes. I'm just, I, I actually, I think the planning department has done great minutes for us for, for many years. And I think that, um, we definitely ran into problems falling behind. I don't think because of the minutes, but because of the pace that we were going at and the length of our meetings and the media, we were doing zoning amendment after zoning amendment. And so I think, you know, that kind of went by the wayside and became this big Michigas of stuff, if I can borrow um, a word not from my culture. But, um, and so I just think it's, I think, you know, the, the, the minutes that I've seen come out of the department have always been really good. And so I just want to be clear and have people understand what's going on without it being a, a transcript. And I realized now that I listen to transcripts, we don't say that. We say things buried in many words. And so it's, I just, I appreciate the work that and effort that you've all been doing. Thank you, Janet. Andrew? Yeah, I'd like to rescind my motion then for these minutes. All right, I, I certainly accept your rescinded, rescind. Um, and, and Chris, I wonder whether it might be worth uh, sending us a few representative minutes from other bodies, whether it's somebody in town or uh, I don't know if it was you or Pam that said you had seen the planning board minutes from Northampton. Um, you know, I think it'd be useful for us all to see how far or, or not, how far out of normal we are, what we're doing. And I guess I will say also that I think the fact that we're recording these minutes, these, all these meetings makes it much more difficult to produce succinct brief minutes because there's all that information in those recordings that, you know, you can always go back and check. Whereas before anybody recorded minutes, you did it as fast as you could what, during the meeting and you never had another chance to hear that information again. So that's just a side commentary. Maria? Thanks, Doug. Um, I just wanna put it out there that uh, our minutes didn't used to be 20 pages long in previous boards and that some things shifted and minutes should not be this long and this wordy. Um, well, I, I well think that we but, definitely look at other towns and other boards because this is a change that happened in the last three years. It, it was not this long before three years. So just okay. putting that out. So maybe Chris, if you could pull a, a set of minutes from five years ago and just you know include that in our examples. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Janet? Okay. All right, so that's it for the minutes. And we'll move on to item number two. The time is seven o'clock and it's now time for public comment period. And so I'll remain, remind the participants that uh, you are not allowed to talk tonight in public comment period about either of the hearings that we will hold later in the meeting. So for right now, no comments on the Amherst College wayfinding signs and no comments on the uh, site plan review for 534 Main Street. All right, do we have any public comments?
All right, I don't see any. All right, so we'll move right on to topic number three. And so this is public comment, or this is a public hearing. All right, so the time is 7.01. And in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2022-05, Amherst College Wayfinding Signs at multiple addresses. Request site plan review approval under Article 8 of the Zoning Bylaw of three wayfinding environmental signs to be located at multiple addresses on and off the Amherst College campus, including 62 Boltwood Avenue, map 14A, parcel 273 in the RG Zoning District, 212 Northampton Road, map 14C, parcel 13 in the RN Zoning District, and 425 Southeast Street, map 17B, parcel 3, RN, and RLD slash FC zoning district. Are there any board disclosures? Uh, Chris, should I recognize your hand? I just wanted to give an, a little introduction. Um, as you'll remember, Amherst College presented a number of signs um, on September 1st. And we also had uh, the town has a sign project that we're working on. And we worked very hard with Amherst College to coordinate our signs with theirs so that there wouldn't be an overabundance of signs. And as a result, some of their signs, um, they were gracious enough to offer to move. And others of their signs um, didn't actually make it into the first packet. So that's what we're doing here is we're kind of cleaning things up and um, bringing these last three signs to you. So I just wanted to make that connection that this is connected to the package that you saw on September 1st. Thank you. All right, thanks, Chris. So uh, who will be making the presentation for the applicant? Seth. 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 That's me. All right, welcome, Seth. Nice to be here. Um, I don't think we need to uh, spend a, a whole lot of time presenting. Um, it's, I'm happy to be here. Good to see everyone again. Um, let me share my screen. I'm allowed to do that, right? Uh, you should be. Okay. Is it, is it up? Yes, it is. Oh, sorry, this is not the first page. Um, as Christine mentioned, um, these are not additions to the signage package. Uh, our overall science package, that is. Two of the three were mistakenly left out of your first review. Um, that was our fault. We didn't have a chance to get them in where they would be uh, duly notified to all the abutters. And the last was moved in response to concerns about uh, signage clutter. And it went out of town council's jurisdiction and came into yours. And so these are just three of the uh, 80 something signs um, that have now fallen into your jurisdiction. And so we're trying to clean everything up so we can uh, wrap this whole thing up. Uh, this was just a summary. So the first one is B1003. This one was previously, I don't know if people can see my cursor. This one was previously on the other side of Boltwood Avenue's intersection with College Street. It was over here. There was we, a can, concern, we can see your cursor. Um, there was a concern that um, it, there were too many signs from this corner to this corner at South Pleasant. Um, and in discussions with the town, it moved from here to, to move away from a town sign uh, over to here, which then puts it into our property. It is a um, vehicular directional. It is directing people um, toward the athletic complex. The intention is to direct people to turn left, uh, which is a tricky, um, tricky situation because we don't want them to turn left onto Boltwood, which is a one way going uh, the other direction, but we want them to continue going straight and then turn left. Um, and so it's the same sign that we proposed, same uh, scale, same detail, same sign type that we proposed for all the other large vehicular directionals. It's just, uh, was just moved. This is the same sign that was 
um, half a block further. The ghosting in of this sign here is where the town sign is. Um, and you can see there's also a lot of state highway signs and uh, lane signs. And um, so we were just trying to avoid some sign clutter. Um, this one, C1A0113, is a building identification. It is for, or in this case, not exactly a building, but it's for the fields. Um, it's on Northampton Road. Uh, it's intended to be, be behind the fence. So it is entirely on our property, but, um, but it is uh, larger than is permitted by right. Um, it is the same scale as, again, same detail, same scale as the other, uh, other um, C1 signs uh, that we reviewed before. The only difference is we are using a mammoth on ones that relate to athletics. And so this one has the mammoth on it. Um, and then the last one is over by the Buckham Plowfield, um, mistakenly left out of your packet last time. It's behind our property lines. As well. it's, um, and it's the same one as the one before for the fields, except this one has the Buckham Plow logo, uh, same type again. And so I think it's uh, pretty, from our perspective, pretty straightforward, all kind of the same types as before, just uh, three ones that we didn't get into the packet the first time. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have any, uh, oh, Chris, do you wanna say something? Oh, I just wanted to remind everybody that in these zoning districts, I think all of them are residential zoning districts and um, the signs are limited to being four feet high and um, 12 square feet. So that's what's shown on this chart. And just like the other signs that, you've re that you reviewed previously, which are listed down below, um, many of them were also in residential districts and we're limited to four feet high and 12 square feet. So you're granting, uh, you're being asked to grant um, a, a waiver under section 8.5 of the zoning bylaw, which allows, if I had had time, I would have written this up and I apologize for not having done that, but um, section 8.5 is modifications and waivers and it allows any section or subsection of Article 8 sign regulations may be waived or modified by the permit granting board, which would be the planning board, or special permit granting authority authorized to act under the applicable section of the bylaw. And so the planning board is authorized to act on uh, matters having to do with um, nonprofit educational institutions. Um, and it's for compelling reasons of public convenience public safety, aesthetics, or site design. So you would need to make a finding that, this, um, that these signs are uh, being um, allowed to be larger and taller for reasons of public convenience, public safety, aesthetics, or site design. And in my opinion, it would be public convenience and public safety so people would know where they were going. Thank you, Chris. All right, uh, so we'll have board discussion, Andrew. Thanks, Doug, and uh, thanks for the presentation, Seth. The only, uh, the only point I was going to make, um, I wasn't sure if that first sign was the actual sign, but I just, you know, for what it's worth, the I think the direction of the arrow on the sign was a could be a little confusing with the sort of up to the left since the, left. the road goes to the left if you keep going straight. That um, you right. know, typically you'd see something that just is like a perpendicular or, um, you know. 90 degree, but otherwise um, I, I'm comfortable. Thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, Chris, did you raise your hand again? Oh, sorry, nope. All right, um, I'm not seeing any other board hands. Uh, okay, do we have any public comment on this from any of the public attendees? I don't see any of that either. All right, so if there's no more discussion, uh, does anybody want to make a motion with regard to these this, this, these three signs and the proposed design of them? Tom. So I will move to approve these three signs um, as a means to improve public convenience and or safety um, in, in these districts. All right, um, Andrew. 
I'll second the motion. All right. Any further discussion? Okay, so we'll do another roll call. Maria. Approved. And Jack. Approved. Tom. Approved. Andrew. Aye. Uh, Janet. Aye. Johanna. Approve. And I approve as well. So that's unanimous. And we will close that public hearing. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, Seth. All right, the time is 7.12, and we will now open the second public hearing, actually two public hearings, uh, I guess. Uh, so in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2022-06 and SPP 2022-02, Christine Lindstrom, 534 Main Street and associated parking lot across the street. Request site plan review approval under sections 3.325 and 3.332 of the zoning bylaw for alterations to the site plan for a mixed use building to accommodate interior alterations and to request a modification of the total number of parking spaces required for the mixed use building under section 7.9 of the zoning bylaw and request a special permit to modify special permit ZBA 77-1 to allow 16 parking spaces in the associated lot on the south side of Main Street, rather than 14 spaces originally permitted and to waive the requirement for an accessible parking space in the associated parking lot under section 7.9 of the zoning bylaw. Map 14B-128 and 14B-133 BN and RG zoning district. Uh, do we have any board disclosure? Not seeing any. Um, Chris, do you want to make any introduction or should we go right to the uh, applicant? I would like to make an introduction. Yep. Um, I wanted to um, say that this is a project that's been, this is a, 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 a property that's been long standing. Um, you received special permits. I think there was a copy of one from 1965 and one from 1977. There was a subsequent one in two the, 2012, but that's since expired, so I didn't bother to put it in the packet. But essentially, um, it's a building on the north side of Main Street that has um, four residential units and um, currently has two businesses in it. And over the years, uh, the building has kind of waxed and waned with commercial use and um, residential use. Um, and back in 1965, the owner of uh, the building on the north side of Main Street um, acquired and started using the property across the street, um, 14B-133, as a parking lot and got permission to do so. And um, so this is kind of carrying that forward. Um, the permission was granted in 1977 for a gravel parking lot for 14 cars. And now you're being asked to do two things. One is to um, review the site plan review for the mixed use building, which is uh, the building that exists there now. They're adding a use to it, which is why you're being asked to view this as a site plan review. Um, the use that they're adding is a, is a school for uh, children and art, art classes for children. The existing uses are um, fitness together and um, archival matters and the Valley uh, Frameworks, which is really one business. Um, and the person who owns the building, Christine Lindstrom, I'm sure she'll you know, explain it to more, you in more detail, but she's asking to add two parking spaces um, to the lot across the street. And therefore um, it's needed to uh, amend the special permit for that lot. Um, 
and she's also asking to only have one handicapped space and that handicapped space she wants to be close to the building which makes sense because it's accessible to the building um, and having a handicapped space on the south side of the street she feels is um, is not safe because people will have to cross the street so that's those are two things that you're being asked to do site plan review for this new use that's being added to the building namely the art class school and um, amend the special permit for the parking lot across the street Thank you. And Christine right. Lindstrom is here to make her presentation. All right. So Christine, why don't you uh, take it away if you have a camera and you want to turn that on? Or maybe Laura, maybe uh, Laura Fitch, you may be doing the presentation. I'm not sure. You're still muted, Christine. We can see you. Christine Lindstrom is muted. There we go. I am unmuted. Um, I'm Christine Lindstrom. Nice to meet you all. Uh, all right. So I'm just going to share my uh, share my screen. Mm. Is that working? Sorry, technical difficulty. Is it share screen or share? Um, Should be share screen at the most. Uh, I yeah, see maybe, it at the yeah, and then it's. Uh, I just don't know which one so that I can get to my desktop. You can do either one of them. If you see your document there, when it shares, gives you a choice, you can click on that and only share that. Um, yeah, I was actually just going to share a picture of the building at this point. Um, let me try one more time. Maybe, maybe Laura, you could help out because I'm not getting to what I want to get to. Well, I have lots of pictures, but I don't know specifically what you want. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try that. Is that working? There you go. That works. Okay. So this is 534 Main Street. Um, and uh, I have a couple of the business owners um, who have uh, joined the presentation too, who just want to introduce themselves. But, um, you know, as Chris said, um, the um, reason for the site review is because we, uh, although we have pre-existing businesses that, um, that are essentially shuffling around in this building, um, one of the businesses is actually changing use or, or adding an additional use that hadn't previously existed. So um, looking at this, the building from this side, you can see um, on the left-hand side, there's a sign that says Valley Frameworks. It's black with gold letters. Um, Fitness Together is actually in a suite adjoining or adjacent to the Valley Framework, where the Valley Framework sign is located. And Fitness Together, which is a gym, uh, would like to expand from its suite, which is Suite C, um, expand into Suite A and B. Uh, meanwhile, Valley Frameworks, or I Archival Matters, is moving upstairs. So you can see the suite above the sign, Valley Frameworks. Um, that's going to be um, where Archival Matters is located. And Archival Matters um, is bringing on another business to run art classes out of one of the suites. So I just wanted to take a, a quick minute and have the business owners introduce themselves and they can just tell you quickly um, what uh, they plan to do with their business. Um, and then we can just move into the questions around parking. So um, Jessica, are you, um, or Chris, are you able to give Jessica Feneff the ability to speak to kind of quickly introduce herself and introduce fitness together? Pam, we can't hear you. Hello, can you, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Jessica Feneff and I'm the owner of Fitness Together. Um, we are a 
private personal training studio. So we work with clients one-on-one -on -one, um, in private suites. Um, currently in, in our current space, we have two, um, two suites that we work with clients in, um, a small office and a small lobby area. So we are looking to um, bump into the space adjacent to us to have um, a little bit more space for our clients. All right. Thanks, Jessica. Um, okay, Pamela, can we um, switch to Ani Rivera, the owner of um, Archival Matters and Valley Frameworks? All right. I think we've... we've Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, uh, my name is Ani Rivera and um, I am owner of Archival Matters and Valley Frameworks. And I have been in, at 534 Main Street for 10, 10 years now. Uh, I've been in business for 25 years, uh, working uh, specifically with uh, museum collections and university and, and public art collections. And um, the business uh, during COVID um, was greatly affected, obviously, like everybody else. And um, I started seeing people by appointment, which has worked really well for me. And so I, uh, the space upstairs became available and it was really perfect uh, for, uh, for my needs. And it also came with a separate uh, private space that, that's connected to the main space. But, um, but my daughter at the time was looking for space to do her uh, small workshop classes with. And so I offered her the space. Uh, there have been art classes there uh, before and I didn't uh, see a problem with her doing small classes out of the, the space. Um, there's uh, egress and there's all the requirements that all of you have, uh, have before you uh, uh, documentation on. And, uh, and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, so that's um, the questions around altering the site. That's essentially what we're doing is um, Ani is moving the archiving upstairs um, and sectioning off a, a portion of his suite for um, small group art classes while Jessica is expanding and taking over the entirety of the first floor for, um, for her fitness studio. So um, then we get into the issues around parking. Um, to uh, accommodate these changes, um, we actually uh, 23 spaces are actually required. And um, I would like to have a waiver of one space um, to be able to accommodate these changes with just 22 parking spaces. Um, to get to 22 parking spaces, I'm asking to modify the 1977 special permit that allows, um, currently allows 14 parking spaces across the street. I would like that to be increased to 16. Um, and that 16 across the street plus the six that you see before you um, gets us to the 22. So um, here's the six that are at the building. And then um, let me pull up uh, an image of the parking lot from across the street. Um, so caddy cornered across the street or um, is uh, a, a parking lot. <laughs> um, we're, not, we're not seeing it. Are you wanting to share that? Um, your screen sharing is paused. New share. Ah, bummer. Sorry, guys, I'm not that smooth with this kind of thing. All right, share. Is that working? Yes. Yep. Okay. So the, across the street um, is where the majority of the parking for the building is located. Um, and this is the section 
of the building that currently carries the special permit from 1977, um, allowing for 14 parking spaces. So um, we have measured it out and um, in, it can accommodate it with no changes to the um, parking lot otherwise we can go ahead and put 16 spaces here. So that's what I'm proposing to do. Um, one thing that uh, in the process of this site review that came to my um, attention is that these spaces all need curb stops or some type of delineation or demarcation. As you can see here, that currently doesn't exist. So I am planning at this point to put um, uh, landscape timber uh, curb stops. I'm going to put 16 of them along the side there in order to demarcate the 16 spaces. But um, that is what the parking lot looks like across the street. Um, you can't quite see, but um, to the left hand side of this picture um, is actually a right of way. The properties behind the parking lot are all on Sunrise Avenue and they all have written into their deeds um, permission to use this section, uh, the left-hand section here as, um, as a right-of-way for them to be able to access Main Street. Okay, is that it, Christine? Sure. Yeah, and so um, we'll leave it at that, I guess, and just get into discussion. I don't right. have anything more throughout or more to, uh, they're out there for now. All right. Uh, maybe you could stop your screen share. All right. Um, Andrew, I see your hand, but Chris has hers up too. Chris? I just wanted to note that I did send a draft um, development application report out last night mm -hmm. listing various things that I thought you might want to know about this project. And then today I sent out a revised version. And one of the things I noticed was that the um, uh, parking lot across the street um, is maxed out. Actually, it's over. It's non-conforming as to lot coverage. Um, and so um, there was a question that came up at the, oh, well, I should leave the site visit uh, to a report by one of the board members. But I just wanted to note that there is that report in your email in case you haven't had a chance to look at it. And, and Doug might want to um, track through it at some point. I'm sorry it came out so late. Thank you. All right. Andrew, you have your hand up, I assume, for the site visit report? Uh, no, not for the site visit. I was not there, actually. Someone want to do that first? Yeah, why don't we see who was there? Was anybody able to attend? OK, I see Janet's physical hand. Yes. All right, why don't you go ahead? So um, Maria was there and I was I, I attended and Jack came in for the parking lot portion. And so in terms of the building across the street, um, it's a little confusing. There's six spaces out on the western side with one handicapped space. And the building's kind of been attached, like extended. And so the um, part that will become the archival thing is actually on the second floor, but actually has street like access directly from the site. And there's another handicap space marked there and a few other spaces and some garbage um, bins, lar large um, um, dumpsters. Um, and then if you go across the street, it kind of goes down pretty sharply. And it looks to me like an unpaved lot or some really old gravel. And when we looked at it, it was clearly, you could put 16 spaces in. If you wanted to, you could dig out some more if you, you know, it, it kind of, it really, it really goes down from the street. So it could be expanded more towards Main Street. And um, we looked at the right of way, which was pretty deeply rutted. Um, and that's it. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, Maria, am I missing something? Maria? It, just, it looked like it would be a, quite a haul. Uh, I don't think it's for us to say that it was easy enough to add more spaces because it would require a major retaining wall because of the slope. But the space they had was, like you said, um, gravel. And um, when we were there, there were um, 13 cars and one pulled away. And um, uh, it sounded like from what uh, 
Chris, Christine said, oh, Christine said that um, that was kind of typical number of spaces being used on a normal working day. Um, and then on the other side, I took a spot, I think maybe some other planning board members took spots. And so um, it looked like, I think Christine, you said it was a typical day. It wasn't a hundred percent full, but it was maybe over half full. And then um, when we crossed the street, it, you know, it was, cars go really fast on that street. So I would not recommend any wheelchair attempting that cross uh, without a crosswalk. But um, otherwise, I think that's the only things we observe. Um, I think Chris, you talked at length about the right of way, the town right of way and how it was really um, not something that we needed to talk, get into with that um, as far as what um, Christine presented of her property, it looked like we weren't going to be changing anything other than just demarcating the 16 spots. Um, also, I think um, Ms. Ms. Lindstrom told us that the um, there were eight parking spaces in the long lot for tenants because there's four units and those eight spaces were the farthest to the south. Um, but they weren't designated, but that's where they where people were parking and then I had asked, is this parking, like, how is it used? It, does it get full? And Ms. Lindstrom said there's usually some spaces and it, um, and the tenants, you know, use it at night and there's a lot of day use. Um, and that the day users of the building usually prefer to park um, close to the building, but obviously people, there were 13 cars. So there was, there were people were obviously using the lot. Um, I think that's it. Okay, thanks, Janet. Andrew. Uh, thanks, Doug. Thanks for the presentation, Christine. Um, so uh, I, I regret not being able to make the visit, and I'm going to sound really ignorant here, but this property is on the on the intersection of High Street and Main Street, right? So when when we say the parking lots across the street, which street is it across? For starters, it's across Main Street, and then it's not directly across. It's like it's to the west. I just I, I'm not even sure exactly where this lot is. And I, I'm not sure if it would be possible just to pull up like a Google Street View or a Google Map or something just to, to like make to, sure I'm following properly. Would you like me to share a screen with um, bike plans? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, the, Laura. The Denny Jones map is also helpful. The Denison Jones map. Thanks, Janet. Okay. This. Okay, so it's it's basically the. So, so this is High Street. I, I can zoom in a little bit um, more. If I move this over here, can you still see it? Uh, no. No. Put it back to the screen you were on. Okay. I mean, uh, this I'll is, zoom, this, this, is the, this is the this is the talking about. Sorry. Yeah. So um, this is High Street here. This is Main Street. This is um, sort of the residential per portion. Yes. Yeah. Um, the shape of the commercial, on, which is on two floors, and the parking that's adjacent to it, the handicapped space. Then across the street is. I'm with you. Okay. Is this area. Very good. All right. Thanks for clarifying that for me. Is the is the second floor business? Um, is it accessible now? Is there a, an elevator lift? Yeah, so it's somewhat accessible and there's no requirement in terms of ADA upgrades to make it more accessible. Okay. You know, there's certain triggers that require you to make it more accessible. So um, there is a ramp in this area that goes to a deck and the doors are three feet wide. The ramp is not entirely conforming and we're adding a handrail to make it more conforming. But like I said, there's no change that's um, triggering um, you know a, a complete redo of that okay um, and then could you just scroll that up the, that PDF a little bit yeah. I was just wondering so I mean in terms of the number of spaces that that seems reasonable oh, sorry that's okay I was just wondering though in terms of the reduction of the ADA location uh, ADA or the, the parking spot does it like had you considered making that? So correct me if I'm accessible? wrong, Christine, but there was, we actually call for this sign that's against this ramp 
to be removed because this isn't a legal parking spot. This land Correct. belongs to the town. So even though it has been used as a handicap accessible parking and has that sign there, it's not actually a legal spot. You know, I, I guess it seems to me like the you could put another handicap spot here to be to be compliant. I'm just I don't know if you were able to see the annotation I had there, but just basically on the other side of that one spot. Oh, he. I'm sorry. Here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering, had you considered like wh why not just do that to make sure that there are, there are two spaces? And and actually, before you answer that, I apologize for adding more on. I, I'm not familiar with ADA law specifically. I think in your in your proposal, you said that it was not required by law by federal law. So I'm not sure if anybody could expound upon that. Just just for clarity. Um, you mean what I said in terms of in, um, improving the existing ramp? I, I think that what I, I thought what I had read was that in the proposal it said that, you know, we were seeking, you were seeking to go from two ADA accessible locations to one and that only one is required by law. So Andrew, there's, there's actually two laws that are relevant here. One is the federal ADA legislation. Yeah. And I believe that would only require one space that's ADA accessible. However, town of Amherst has a bylaw that would require a second ADA space. And that's the uh, request for the variance. Got Christine, it. Okay. is that correct? That is correct. So federal, the with one space here, we're meeting state and federal law because um, you go to two handicapped spaces when you hit 25 parking spaces. Whereas um, Amherst law is uh, once you've hit 20 spaces, you have to have two. Okay. So, um, so that is the distinction that the Amherst zone zoning bylaw is more stringent than the state and the federal guidelines. Got Do you it. Want to say, um, we could cut to, as Janet um, suggested earlier, we could cut to um, a 1987 survey um, that was done uh, when this building was under the ownership of Denny Jones um, to sort of show how much of the, I'll, I'll, it's gonna be on me. So you guys are gonna have to be patient. I can pull it up if I think. Oh, you can't, oh, thanks, Laura, what a lifesaver. Um, tell me which one it is again. Um, 1987. So at any rate, um, so the issue is, uh, and I didn't know this again until we started undergoing this process, the current handicap space outside of the second floor is actually sitting in the middle of town right of way. So it's just, it's actually not viable. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a lie of a handicap parking location. So- um, Is this what you're referring to? Exactly. So that that area that um, Laura is using her is circling her Chris are around. Um, there is a handicapped parking sign, but there's not enough um, space that's actually on my property specifically to site a handicapped parking space because obviously you not only need this parking space, but then you need the access um, uh, space on the side. So. Um, Likely I'd have to go to town council and go through, I mean, I have no idea what that process is like um, to site a parking spot there if I could find the room for it. And I would need to ask the town to be able to be located in part on um, town right away for that. Okay, yeah, I guess, okay, no, uh, thank you. I was gonna say, um, it seems like the businesses that are here in the retail establishment establishments are essentially all by appointment so you'd have some sense of of what that use might look like um so so i guess question would be maybe for chris is if uh, you know another retail tenant came in who wasn't by uh, appointment would we would we have an opportunity to to review that i guess i i'm just i'm a little you know, what makes me concerned is just there's one spot for, for two businesses, really kind of three businesses almost. 
Um, and I understand it's it's one of the five. So on site, it seems like it's reasonable, but um, would we have an opportunity to, I guess, kind of approve this only based on the current tenant mix of by appointment retailers? All right, Andrew, Chris, do you have an answer to that? Um, well, I just wanted to say that when tenants change, um, we are aware of that. And so the inspectors um, evaluate what is being changed and then determine what kind of um, permitting is needed. So if the tenants in the building change, then either um, they would be approved by what we call Article 14, which you will, you will see later, um, by the building commissioner. The Article 14 is a temporary type of zoning that allows certain uses to be approved by the building commissioner during this COVID period. Or um, it would be sent to the planning board or the zoning board of appeals, depending on what the use is. So one board or another or the building commissioner would have an opportunity to review the change. And I think that answers Andrew's question about um, you know, how that would affect the site. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, Christine, do you have a comment? Um, I think I, I was gonna show a picture of that area that we were just discussing. I have another photo, if that's helpful. Otherwise, we don't need to do that. All right, why don't we hold off on that for the moment? Janet? So I went, I went back and looked at that, the site today. Um, I'm okay on the reduction in spaces because I think the peak uses of the tenants are different times than the peak uses of um, the business, the people using the businesses. So 20, you know, the reduction in spaces seems very um, easy to me. And also knowing that the lot is really never full is also very helpful. Um, I'm not okay on reducing the handicapped spaces. And I think um, it would be easy just to add the space where Andrew showed like next to, you know, put the two handicapped spaces together. Um, and, but you know, when I went back and looked is that there is a handicap, there are two handicapped spaces. One's like the informal one. Um, it looks adequately sized for someone to use. And there's a ramp right there. And it made me wonder, is there somebody who regularly uses that space and regularly uses that ramp um, in those businesses? I don't know if it's the people who run it or a regular customer, but it, and then when I also looked, there was a, there was somebody using the, um, the more formal space right by the front doors. And so, so, you know, so that was my, one of my questions was, is there somebody who's handicapped who uses those, that spot, the informal spot? There were also two cars parked along the western side next to the dumpster. So there's a lot of space there. It's not in the street and that's in probably mostly the public right of way. And so I was, you know, like, how do we make this work, right? And, you know, I have a 30 foot right, public right of way in my front yard and I use my front yard. You know, I, I have a swing on it. You know, people are in the yard. And I, you know, for this is like maybe a question for Christine Brestrup is, you know, could we condition this permit that the, the businesses can use this informal handicap space until town council pulls, you know, they're not, I mean, the town has the right to, to do something that public way, but now it's not using that. Could we, could we do the condition, the permit saying to, you know, keep two handicap spaces, you can continue to use this informal space. If that condition, conditions change, just add the, um, an extra space near the front door. I mean, it seems like the site has worked well for the users. All right, thanks, Janet. Uh, Chris? I, I think that um, it sounds like that would be logical, but I don't think that the planning board can um, allow something that wouldn't be necessarily allowed by the town. So I think what I would say is that the planning board has to stick to the private property and make its decision about the private property. and you know, chances are people can continue to use those spaces that are around that northwest corner of the building, but the planning board can't make a determination or an approval or anything about that. They, it's kind of something that, you know, 
if the town starts to have a problem with it, the town can do something about it. But until then, it's okay to use those spaces, but you can't count them as something that meets the requirement. Does that make sense? It kind yeah, of does. I mean, we, we don't have the authority to allow a use on public land. Yes, that's right. It's easy. You said that very well. Uh, Christine, you wagged your finger. Are you trying to get my attention? Yeah, I mean, I am very interested in pursuing um, what my options are with the town council now that I know that's the path. Um, I don't want to, you know, sort of hold up this entire proposal and, and stop Ani and Jessica from, you know, pursuing their business goals while yeah. I explore what's happening. But um, uh, so I don't know if it's worth, just to throw it out there that I'm not gonna kind of let it lie. Uh, it bothers me tremendously <laughs> that um, there's no handicap access for the second floor. So um, I just don't know how long that process lasts. I don't know what it takes. Um, and so, Maybe it's one of these things where if, if I can show that I'm in good faith that I'm pursuing a path with the town council, um, wherever that path might lead, you know, that could be something that could be taken into consideration. Um, it's definitely right. an intention because um, it is in, extremely bothersome to me to not have handicap access on the second. Okay, uh, Chris, um, would we be able to give a, a decision on this, say a waiver that on the second handicapped at, uh, space for a, a specific period of time, at which point we would require her to come back? So say five years, you know, and if she came back in five years and hadn't gotten anywhere with the town council, then at that point we could say, no, you now you have to put the second handicapped space in. Chris, you are muted. I think you could do that. It would be a question of how would um, the town remember uh -huh. that this was the case. And right now we don't have a really good system of tracking things like that. We, we rely on people's you know, honesty, like you know, the survival center came back after a year, like you asked them to, but, um, and I'm sure that Christine is very honest too, but it's, it would, you know, she might get busy and forget about it. So, okay. Uh, you know, all right. So we, so we could technically could do it, but it has some downsides. Yeah. Andrew. I was just going to ask, since we have, uh, I think it was Jessica and Ani, the business owners on, do they feel like having a second, uh, accessible spot in that, in that, uh, front parking lot would adversely affect their business. Jessica or Ani, um, you're muted if you're talking. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's really important to have uh, a handicap access uh, from the second floor. Uh, the ramp is right there. Um, and now and then I might get a visitor who, who is wheelchair bound and they will need to enter. And so um, I think it's really kind of important uh, in my view that we have or we provide access to all, all people uh, in, in that. Uh, Ani, I think the question was actually, do you feel your business would be hurt in any way if on the lower parking lot, next to the building, we required a second handicapped access, uh, handicapped space. Um, I don't think the business will be hurt, no. Um, I think it's, it's just convenient to be, if you're on a wheelchair, keep in mind that it's, it's uphill from, yeah. from the lower level to my space. So right. somebody on a wheelchair will need help to get up that hill and come into my space um, compared to now it's not it's not a, a negative thing to have them park at the bottom, but it is uh, it could be an inconvenience and it could be dangerous for somebody to try 
and come up that hill. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so in essence, it wouldn't hurt you, but it might not actually benefit you because anybody with in a wheelchair wouldn't park down there. Right. Okay. Andrew, uh, did that answer your question? I, I think so. I guess I was going to basically take your proposal, Doug, and flip it. What if it's yeah. we go with two until and, and let Christine see if she can make it one? Right. At which point we change it down the road. But to me, it seems like um, I, I, I'd rather see the two spaces there. I can see the ramp or I can see the change of grade, but that would also add like, uh, you know, many, many wheelchairs are motorized as well and would be able to, to, to manage that. Um, so anyhow, that, that would be my thought. It's leave yep. it at two with an exception perhaps to uh, change it to one. Down. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Tom. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Thanks, Andrew. That was going to be my comment. I, I think that um, we have an opportunity to maintain two spots on the site. I think we should do that um, and, and request that the second handicap spot be placed um, in that lower level if necessary um, until the client um, or the owner can secure the rights to the upper spot. Um, so that we know that it's a, a valid parking spot and then we can revisit it when, um, when she um, can do so. Um, I also think that many, many handicapped people also come um, with assistance or other people who can help them get up that hill as well, which we should consider. But um, I agree that it's not incredibly safe and I would much rather people park up top, but I still think you have an obligation to put two legal parking spots for handicap accessibility on your site. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, Johanna. Thank you very much. Interesting discussion. Um, I, what would that cut the overall, if, if there was a second accessible spot required in that lot next to the building, would you go from six spots down to four with the space limits? I think there would still be six spaces, but two of them rather than one of them would be limited to handicapped use. Okay. Great, thanks. Right. Thank you, yeah, Matt. I don't. I, I don't have the um, the dimensions. It's, it would take me a minute to just go back and look at the zoning bylaw. I don't. I don't know if it means that we end, end up with an overall reduction of the number of spaces, or if we stay with the six. It's just that two of them are. Yeah. So you haven't done a layout so f of of two handicap spaces in that lower lot. I have not. I mean, okay. I would be that difficult for us to go back and, and do that but I don't think it would be a problem because I think um when you have that stripe between two spaces the spaces themselves are just the same size as a uh, uh, right, space. right okay yeah. so okay. then there would just a label yeah 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 uh Johanna does that conclude your comments it does thank you all right uh, I don't see any more hands. Maybe we'll take a look and see if there are any public commenters. Not seeing any. Uh, now seeing two hands, Chris. So I wanted to note something that we forgot to include in your packet, but I think I did forward it to you. It was uh, an email from Nancy Higgins who lives, I think she lives next door, and she is um, disabled. She's, uh, she has trouble with her eyesight, and she um, put in a plea to um, have two handicapped spaces near the building. So I just wanted to mention that, and I apologize for not um, having included it in the packet, but like I said, I think we did forward her email to you. So I just wanted to make sure you knew about that. All right, thank you. Uh, Johanna. Uh, legacy hand, sorry. Okay, Janet. 
So one, one, the third, the, the one thing I actually appreciate all the accessibility discussion and the effort by the owners to keep as much as possible. I, I was, and I definitely could see that um, on the extended lot, you'd be not only impossible to get up with a wheelchair, but it would be dangerous to cross the street. It felt dangerous for us to cross the street. I had, I had concerns about the, um, you know, the backing out into the right of way and leaving because the right of way was like really deeply rutted. Um, it looked like it had just been, you know, I know there's been a recent rain and it was kind of washed out. And so I began to wonder if maybe that should be filled in with trap rock to sort of stabilize it and make it safer for people who are parking or leaving the parking lot and walking up the street. And I didn't know if that would be something that the building inspector or um, the tenant engineer would have um, some ideas on, or if Chris, the, the, that's a requirement that in a parking lot, it's the surface is safe and, you know, easy, not so slanted. And it's, it was very deeply rutted towards main street. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Chris. So you could um, impose a condition that that um, situation be remedied by adding gravel to that location. Um, that would be a reasonable thing to do because I think that that surface is not in great condition. So since you're being asked to um, agree to adding two spaces there, you can uh, require that the surface of that um, parking lot be improved. And I don't think you need to say over the whole lot, but just that one place where the rutting occurs, which is up on the um, driveway that goes up to Main Street. Thank you. All right, so if there aren't more comments at, the, at this very moment, um, I, was gonna, I was gonna go through Chris's uh, draft development application report. And Chris, um, I'm assuming I can skip over some of the project data at the beginning. Um, although I do see uh, there are a couple of non-conforming conditions, but those are grandfathered in. Um, is, all right, so on item two, on probably the second page, you've got for the sign plan issues to consider. The board may wish to ask the applicant to confirm the information about the existing and proposed signs. The board may also wish to impose a condition that the new signs be reviewed and approved prior to installation. So uh, Jessica, do you have any comments about the signage that you expect associated with the new business at the property? I'm sorry, Christine. Actually, Jessica, go ahead. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll just to defer to her. All right. Um, yeah, so there, the sign that's currently that's um, up there that says Valley Frameworks, I think it was shown in that initial picture that Chris had showed. Yep. yep. Um, that is staying as is. It's just changing to for, with my business name. So the sizing is staying exactly the same. They're just painting over it. So it says fitness together. So that black and gold sign to right there. Yep. Okay. Uh, Chris. <laughs> Chris, would, would painting over that sign with a new name can constitute a new sign? It will constitute a new sign. Yeah. So, and so that um, sign is oversized. The sign isn't really oversized. It's um, you're allowed to have 10% of the building wall covered with a sign. So the sign is less than 10% of the building wall. So the question for the planning board is, do you want to see an image of that new sign before they paint it up there? Or are you happy that they could do a good job of it without your seeing it to review it and approve it? Okay, thank you, Andrew. I, I don't need to see a rendering of the new sign, but I was curious whether Ani would have a, a sign for um, the Valley Frameworks business added as well. And apologies if it was in the pack and I forgot. 
Uh, hi, uh, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, honey. Hi, uh, yes, um, uh, we have uh, design plans for, for two signs, one for archival matters and one for um, uh, Feather Press Studio. And you could see the building here where these uh, two large panels are, are installed. They are 21 inches high by 12 feet wide each and the top one will be for archival matters and the bottom one will be for feather press. And we do have the designs and we were hoping uh, my, my daughter Maya, who is the uh, owner of feather press, uh, we do have those designs available, but we are having problems actually getting a, a visual of ourselves on, on this. So uh, she was able to, if she could present them she would, and um, but it, because we do have them, we could email them to you as uh, PDFs and you can review them um, and give us any comments. And we're happy to, uh, you know, um, adjust anything that's necessary, uh, but they're very uh, professional, simple, and to the point, they don't, they don't have any, you know, loud designs on them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I don't know, Maya, if you can display these, um, but if, if, if we can't uh, show them now, we'll email them to the board. Chris? So if they can't show them now, um, they could email them to me and I could bring them to you on December 1st for you to approve them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll email them. May I ask a question? Yes, Chris. Um, is there going to be a sign for Valley Frameworks or is Ani just going to have a sign for Archival Matters? It only, it says Archival Matters at the very top. And then in smaller, in, in smaller type uh, below the, the, the main name, it will have um, the different aspects of my business, which is art and preservation, uh, photography, uh, uh, what else? Um, airspace, uh, airspace studios, which uh, is an online gallery that I'm planning to put up. So all these things will be much smaller uh, below archival matters. Um, and the feather press is really just says feather press studio Amherst, and then below that it says uh, I believe it says artwork or art classes for everyone. Um, so those are the, the, that's the extent of the text. All right, so it sounds like it would be very helpful to us when you've got that material ready for you to send it to Chris and, uh, and then she'll bring it to one of our meetings and we will approve it. So this evening, we may wanna consider having a condition that you get our approval for these additional and change signs before uh, you install them. Okay, I could uh -huh. actually email. I could actually email them to Chris now while I'm here, if uh, if that helps. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Chris, do you have anything else you wanted to say at the moment? Um, well, I only heard from um, Andrew about whether anybody wanted to see the sign for fitness together. So. Um, do you want to see an image of the fitness together sign or do you just feel that they can reproduce whatever kind of a sign they had previously on the front of the building and you'll be fine with it? Well, uh, wouldn't it, wouldn't it make sense for us to get to the point of, of, of talking about all of our conditions and have that kind of conversation then? Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, personally, I think we should ask for all information on all the signs. So, Andrew, do you have anything else? I was only going to ask just that the 10% for the, the signage here on High Street, how does that 10% apply? Yeah, or is I mean, 10% for the total building? Because this, and this is more, I, I'm not overly concerned, but, but it, if the 10% is for each building each, face, each it elevation, like yeah. Yeah, I think this is a much smaller elevation, it looks like. So uh, may I uh, ask, uh, Christine had said that the 
total square footage of the facade of the west facade was 600 square feet so you could ask her how she calculated that christine i think i was out there with a tape measure um but I, yeah i mean i don't think that i um i spent a huge amount of time trying to get it exactly right um so if we want precision um I would need to do it again. So the two signs that we see right now are a total of uh, 48 square feet. That's what Christine has represented in her application. And she's represented that the facade is 600 square feet. So the question would be, where is that 600 square feet um, located? Is it the two uh, pieces of the building that you see, the one to the left with two windows and a door, and then the one to the right with a window and two frames. Are those the places that yes. represent the 600 feet? So I think if that is the case, then these two sign frames could be placed there and considered to be, you know, less than 10% of those two faces of the building. Which, that would be my which, 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 are, which are offset by some number of feet. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question is whether we can count all of the what all of the west facing facades along the street there or whether we're limited to a single plane of facade. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Um, is there a standard practice? I mean, because, you know, there's, there, there's the center section of, of facade with the signs on it. There's the section to the left that's been counted in the 600 feet, but there's also a facade to the right that faces west and hasn't been counted. Um, is there a standard practice on that, Chris? There is not a standard practice as far as I know. What I do know is that these two framed signs here were approved in the past and they're kind of existing frames. So I imagine at some point they were approved but I haven't seen any um, documents that state that. So um, if you wanted to just consider the actual facade on which these things are mounted you would need to either grant um, a waiver from the sign requirement the size of the sign requirement under section 8.5 just like you did for amherst college just now or you would ask christine to make the signs smaller so that they would be 10 percent of this facade the one that's um, closest to us may okay. i interject a, a bit who, who was that? Laura Fitch. Okay, Laura. So it seems logical to me that you would want to include both those facades because that is the space that he occupies. So that second floor um, frame shop and archival matters in, um, occupies those two gables and the flat wall with the, um, uh, the two signs frames on it. Yep. And ne never mind the historic aspect. I'm not sure what historic aspect you're referring oh, to. It, that they've been there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Chris? That seems yep. reasonable to me to count both of those if it's um, all part of the same business. Right. And it would mean that there's no additional capacity for signs on the gabled section to the left. That's right. Okay, Maria. Uh, thanks. I feel like a lot of this project is, you know, existing conditions that have now become non-conforming, but it's worked all these decades and the change is slight enough and sort of under enough good management that it's all working now, even though there's a lot of black and white that doesn't match the project. So I feel like, you know, the way we're looking at the parking, um, the way we're looking at signage and um, a lot of this is just, you know, it's been working all this time for these businesses that seem like they're here for the long haul. Um, 
I guess the only new thing we're thinking about is the ADA space, whether we just change that label from number two to ADA. But otherwise, um, yeah, it sounds like the site and the spaces are all working for the current and sort of upcoming sort of slight changes to the businesses. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't see an issue with the signage. It sounds like it's all, you know, it's not right on Main Street. It's also kind of off to the side. So even if it is overly sized for just that portion, it's still, you know, not like blasting on the, you know, the main side of the thoroughfare. Um, but overall, I guess the only thing I would wonder about changing after you go through all the rest of the um, uh, requirements is just the ADA space issue. But otherwise, um, yeah, maybe you can keep going through that list, Doug. Okay. Maybe this. All right, thanks, Maria. Um, so we, we've talked some about imposing a condition that the new signs be reviewed and approved before the planning board or by the planning board before installation. Uh, the third item Chris was mentioning was we may want to require plantings along the west side to screen the parking from the adjacent house, which I assume is across High Street. Um, what is meant by that is there is a fence along the parking lot on the um, south side of Main Street. And one of the previous special permits for that parking lot um, required that there be plantings along there to screen the house that's immediately to the west of the parking lot. So the fence goes a certain distance, but then the fence kind of dies away and the parking lot is still there. So do you want to require that there be um, plantings along that area to screen the parking lot from that house? I, I, would it also be an option to restore the fencing? To put more fencing in? Yes, it would be. Yep. Which I, I gather was originally required. Fencing uh, and planting was required, yeah. OK. Uh, Janet? Um, I would support the plantings. I think a row of shrubs would look great, um, be nice habitat and kind of be a buffer to anyone using the building. It's it's not super attractive. It's useful, the parking lot, but I, I think plantings would be a real, a good idea. And I think it's in the bylaw under site plan review, although I hesitate to put everybody through my search for that. But I do think plantings would be great. Okay. Um, so let's keep that in mind when we're putting together our conditions. Um, just scrolling farther down, I guess uh, item seven, parking, Chris, issues to consider. One of the things that came up during the site visit was whether this lower parking lot that you're looking at now um, should be expanded to include one more space. And I wanted to make the point here that the parking lot is already non-conforming as to lot coverage. So if you were to add a space by creating more gravel, then um, Christine Lindstrom would need to apply for another special permit to um, change a non-conformity. So that's what that's all about. Right, and so the alternative is to allow the waiver and allow one fewer spaces yep. than is required. Mm -hmm. Jack? Yeah, uh, during the, the site visit, um, it, it, the road is exceptionally uh, wide. And Chris has said that there's, so there's two-way traffic that needs to be on that road. And I, for me, I just, I, if you could explain that, it'd be helpful. Because uh, it seems like it's just a huge paved area basically uh but the road is occupying you know the the, the eastern two-thirds of it i guess but I, and your question is for chris yes yeah she mentioned it had to be it's a two-way road which i don't no. know what so the question is whether that's required in the easement yes uh, i haven't chris? 
I haven't seen the written material on the easement, but I would caution the board against, you know, thinking that we could shrink the easement somehow. Right. Uh, Laura, you have your hand up. Do you have some information on that? Um, I have information about the existing um, plantings. Um, I have better photographs of the area that's being shown right now as being sort of a gap in the, yeah. So if I share my screen. Sure. There's actually pretty substantial plantings here. There's only a very small gap between this bush and that fence. And, and once, actually once, once again, once again, we have lots of burning bushes, which don't provide very good habitat for any of our native species. All right. Well, yes, I, I don't like burning bush myself, but um, although it looks great right now, right? Um, <laughs> uh, um, but and there's also trees here. So I just okay. didn't think that, that photograph was very representative. All right. Uh, Christine, uh, has the extent of fence and plantings along here uh, de decreased since that special permit was, uh, was approved? Well, um, that special permit was approved in 77. Um, I took ownership in 18. Um, so, you know, it is what it is from my perspective. Um, I haven't had any complaints or, you know, nobody has reached out from that property to me regarding, um, I don't know, uh, bothersome uh, headlight, headlights at night kind of uh, coming into their yard or anything along those lines. Um, so I, I think somebody said before that the parking lot seems to be working well, and I think it does um, work well and it seems to live well with the neighbors that's what i can offer um and it looks the way it looks okay thank you janet i found my section it's on page 104 it's um 11.2414 provision of adequate landscaping including the screening of adjacent residential uses um, provision of street trees, um, blah, blah, blah. And then there's also a section about um, when a non-residential use adjoins a residential use, putting a, a vegetative buffer. Not entirely clear that this would apply here, but I do think if you had a row of shrubs, native shrubs, I suppose it would just be more attractive and you know provide some habitat and some beauty to the area. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's continue. Um, oh, we, then item eight, the parking, the ADA space, I believe we've pretty much talked about that. Uh, lighting, the board may wish to impose a condition that requires that all exterior lighting shall be downcast and shall not shine onto adjacent properties. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, Christine, were you were requesting a waiver for from lighting? Uh, she, she yeah, was, I mean, she requested a waiver of the lighting plan. Oh, okay, all right. So there is no, new, there's no new exterior lighting proposed. No, I'm just ticking through my head. I believe every single. Um, I I think if this condition were imposed, the building meets it now. I believe every exterior light is downcast. Um, yeah, I did but, survey the existing ones and um, put them on the, the plans that were submitted. So, and they were all downcast. Okay. All right, so that is uh, pretty much close to the end of your of Chris's development application report. Chris, you said the fire department and the town engineer have not commented yet. Should we be waiting for their comments? I think in this case, you don't need to wait for their comments because um, they there's not that much that's being changed on the exterior of the building. And the uh, building 
inspectors are very well aware of what's going on on the inside of the building. In fact, I think we did have a conversation. Wasn't Mike Roy part of our conversation about what was going on on the interior of the building? And I'm asking that of Laura Fitch. Um, it was I, I can't was it was it Roy that was there? I, I guess so. I can't remember who was. I think, I think it was a member of the fire department who was there. So I think you probably don't need to hear from either one of them as far as. Um, but we do have a, we do have a building permit that's including um, improving fire um, separation between the residents and the commercial. It has improved um, smoke detection in the commercial and um, such like that. So, but none of that's related to site plan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, checking one more time for public comment. I'm not seeing any public hands. All right. So um, no hands from the board. So I think we're about at the point where we need a motion. Um, and I have the notes I've taken, we've talked about whether we need whether we will allow one fewer ADA handicap space. Uh, we've talked about potentially requiring repair of the ruts in the parking lot on the south side of Main Street. We've talked about whether to require approving uh, the, the board to approve all the signs before they're installed and whether to require additional fencing or and or planting, and whether we're okay with having one fewer overall number of spaces than the zoning uh, bylaw would require. And then the lighting, if we wanna go there. So does anybody wanna make a motion with some or none or all of these conditions? Andrew. Uh, what you said, Doug. <laughs> I, I, I would say, like, can we can we have this be focused on the parking? Right. So I, I, I would I would have a motion that we would ask them to have two ADA spots that we would waive the or, or uh, uh, allow for the total number required to to be reduced by one. And then I would ask uh, also that we would have some planting to complete the, the buffer um, so that there's a contiguous, continuous um, uninterrupted line of uh, um, screening, you know, visual barrier. And then um, that'd be my motion. And then I would just back on, like, let's address the signage uh, in the future meeting. OK, so that's a motion. Yes, it is a motion somehow. With a condition, okay. with the condition for the signage to come back to you. If it's a condition, well, I was, I guess it could be I mean, a condition to do it that way, or can we just keep it out of the motion and and just oh, ask I mean, the applicant I mean, to come back? Andrew, we we could also handle these conditions sort of sequentially in this meeting, and first vote on the the three conditions that you have just moved, and then we could have a conversation about what we want to, whether we want a condition about signage um, and whether we want a condition about lighting. So I think uh, I'd like to, to do it that way. Um, I'm, com I'm comfortable with that, Doug. Okay, so, so the motion is to impose conditions to require the second, to, to deny the request to have fewer handicapped spots than are required, mm -hmm. to allow the request to have one fewer overall spaces than are required, and to impose a condition for additional screening to complete the screening along that entire frontage with the residential property to the west. Correct. All right, so do we have a second for that? J Jack, I'm seeing seeing your hand. Jack? I'll second. Okay, Janet? 
Jack, you gotta you gotta be quick on the the, <laughs> mute, the mute button there. I've been on mute. Oh my you you oh my I'm god, look, you missed everything you. I said. Oh I'm looking I was at just saying you. how great a chair you 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 are, Doug. I well mean, I'm glad I'm glad we're keeping you awake. <laughs> okay, so that was seconded by Janet. Let's do a let's do a roll call on those three conditions. Uh, Maria. Approve. Jack. Approve. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Uh, Janet. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Okay, so that's the first three conditions. Um, does anybody want to have a condition related to repairing the ruts on the easement? Uh, along, does anybody want to make a motion in that direction? I'm seeing some heads shake no. So oh, Janet, yes. Janet I mean, wants to make that, would like that condition. Do we have a second? Andrew. I'll second. All right. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Let's go through that. Uh, Maria. And no. Thank you, Jack. Uh, you are muted, but it looked like you mouthed no. You are correct. I I, I am so bad. Sorry. Okay. Thank <laughs> I you. I said no. Yeah. Tom. Um, uh, am I allowed to abstain? I did not you witness are. the site. You yeah. are allowed to abstain. I will abstain. I did not see the site. Okay, Andrew. Yeah, no, I didn't see the site either. I'm inclined to say I though. So that's so I will. Thank you. Um, Janet, you are muted. Sorry, I'm going to be an I. I thought they were deep and be hard at night to go across okay. them. So that's, a, that's a second yes. And Johanna? No. And I'm a yes. So Chris, am I right that there are four opposed and three in support? There are three opposed and three in support and one abstention. Ah, so what do we do in a tie? Well, <laughs> you ask, <laughs> you plead with the applicant, please fix your ruts. <laughs> um, I do actually have rut fixing in i have um a landscaper installing the um the 16 curb stops but obviously not until after this meeting and i knew what our situation was and mm -hmm. um, part of what he's doing is filling in um the ruts at the beginning and the end of the right of way okay um so i don't mind having a condition but um, you know, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. All right. All right. So I'll change mine to a nay. And the motion fails. We will not impose the condition, but we'll be watching you. Take a joy ride down the sunset right. prize right. extension. Okay. Um, so lighting, did anybody want to have a condition on lighting? It sounds like we don't, it really wouldn't have any practical effect. Not seeing any hands. All right. Chris, uh, I think we've, let's see. So we've imposed conditions. So do we need a, a general vote for each of these? for the site plan review and the special permit? You can say that you approve the, yes, you need two separate votes. Okay. Yes. All right, so, and, and we can say that the conditions that we imposed apply to bo uh, both of these items, you know, whatever is applicable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Andrew. Apologies, remind me, what, were, what are we doing about the signage? The signage you're asking to come back to you for review. Well, actually, Andrew, I think, thank you for bringing that up. I think that slipped my mind and we didn't, we didn't actually formally 
vote to impose a condition. So does anybody want to impose a condition that the signage be approved, but brought back and approved to us by us before it's installed? I, I would move that myself. So I'll, I'll, I'll move it. Tom, you're seconding it. Yeah. Any discussion? And just a point of clarification. So just before it, it's it's not going to a condition that um, holds up our ability to sort of move forward with the business operation. It's more just the signs themselves before they get installed. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, Andrew. Yeah. I, no, I just wasn't sure what the condition was. I just sort of went quick on that. So we're saying we're approving we're approving it. And then, but they have to come back with the signs, or we're going to um, not approve it until they come with the signs. You're approving it with the condition that they come back with the signs to show them to you before they install the signs. But that doesn't up, uh, that doesn't hold up the other things that they're doing. Essentially, Andrew, they can they can uh, reconfigure the tenants in the building, and introduce the, the new business into the building. And that new business is, and all of those changes are, are part of the, are, are prompting all the parking re requirement review that we've been doing. But when they do the new signage for all this new stuff, they still have to bring that back to us. All right, I don't see any hands. I see a thumbs up from Andrew. So, one more, one more vote, Maria. Approved. Jack. I I think. Approve. All right, excellent. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Thank you for reminding me of that, Andrew. All right, so now we need to make the have the two votes on the, the sort of base motions, which one is the site plan review and the other is the uh, special permit. And, uh, Janet? Um, could you just run through the conditions that we've imposed? I've kind of lost a little track in the separate, separate votes just to so I can get my notes together. OK. We, so uh, we have required that the signs, sign changes be brought back to us and approved before they are installed. Mm -hmm. We have required that additional fencing and uh, planting be um, installed along the west side of the south parking lot. We have allowed one fewer overall number of parking spaces than uh, the zoning would require. And we have denied the request to reduce the number of handicap spots on the north side of the of Main Street from two to one. Okay, so, thank you. So okay. two spaces continue to be required. Thank you. Chris, can you put that in positive language so that it can all be um, approved? Because I think if you deny something, then I have to um, characterize it as a denial of that one thing. So well, could uh, you, you, could, you could say we've, I mean. Could you say that you are requiring we've, that we've there be. We've affirmed, we've affirmed the existing bylaw requirement for two spaces. I mean, you, we could be, in fact, mute about that whole question because we haven't changed anything, but we certainly talked about it enough. I like what you just said. Affirm the existing bylaw requirement for two spaces, two handicapped spaces. Two handicapped spaces. Thank you. All right. Can I have a motion to approve SPR 2022-06 with the applicable conditions we've agreed upon? I will so move. Thank you, Janet. Andrew? Second. Thank you. That was Andrew? That was Andrew. Maria? Approve. 
So yeah. can I ask something? Okay. Um, so this is a site plan review. So are we going to say that it meets all of the relevant criteria of the um, of 11.24 and close the public hearing on the site plan review? Yes. Okay. Close. I will so move. All right. So you're including that in your motion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I'm sorry, we'll start again. Maria. Approve. Thank you, Jack. Approve. Tom. Approve. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And I'm an aye as well, and unanimous. Okay, and then, um, for the second general applications, special permit 2022-02, we will approve the permit with the applicable conditions. Uh, we will, let's see, what are the two things? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's in conformance with the applicable bylaw sections. And 10. we will close- 10.38 in this case. 10. 10.38. And we will close the public hearing. Do we have a motion for that? Um, Doug, are we, we're not approving the entire request in the special permit though, right? We're require, we're, we're approving the request with the conditions that were previous that, that are applicable to that that particular application. Okay, so we're allowing 16 spaces but maintaining the 288 spaces. I'll, I'll make that motion. Right. So, okay. so yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Tom, your hands up to second it. Second. All right, any further discussion? No. Uh, Chris, I assume your hand is legacy. Oh, sorry. Good. Maria. Approve. Jack. Approve. Tom. Approve. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Approve. Approve. And, and Johanna. Aye. And I'm an I as well. All right. So we've closed that public hearing. Uh, the time is eight thirty-eight. Good. Uh, what? Do people want to take a break? Yeah. Take a five minute break. All right. So, so why don't we come back at 843? So uh, Andrew, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I was going to just say while while the, the presenters are on the phone that it's just um, we've been hearing how like, you know, retail's dying and how businesses are really suffering. And it's just it's really great to to have folks come to the board that are growing their business. It's just it's really exciting to hear. So, you know, congratulations to all of you and I wish you well. All right, thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Christine and Ani and uh, your whole team. Hi, everybody. Thank All you. Right. So the time is 8.39 now, and we'll come back at, let's just say 8.45.
All right, the time is 8.46. And it looks like we've got all but one member back, at least videos. There she is, Johanna Newman's back. I'm back. I'm gonna turn my video off while I finish my dinner. All right, you can also mute. Okay, all right, so it's 8.46 and we're resuming our meeting. Uh, we have another public hearing to, to, be, to get through. So I'll read the preamble for that. Uh, in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding zoning bylaw article 14 amended temporary zoning regarding permitting for certain uses during the COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath to see if the town will vote to amend article 14 of the zoning bylaw temporary zoning regarding permitting for certain uses during COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath by extending the expiration date until December 31st, 2022, to help businesses to more quickly emerge from the economic disaster created by the COVID-19 pandemic. So do we have any board uh, disclosures? I do not see any. All right, uh, Chris, uh, who would be presenting this? I will present it. Um, I asked Rob if he wanted to be here, but he's been at a couple of late meetings lately, so he decided not to attend. Anyway, um, Article 14 is um, an article that was put in place, I think it was in June of 2020, and it was an effort to um, try to get businesses back on track to allow outdoor dining, um, to allow expansion of um, already existing businesses, to allow new restaurants and retail shops to open up without having to go through um, uh, extensive uh, permitting processes. And it's um, it's been very successful. Um, I think we gave you a copy of a, an e uh, um, a memo that Rob had written about some of the businesses that have um, been helped by this. Um, so just to run down a few, the lift in Northampton, or excuse me, in North Amherst um, on Coles Road, they started offering their services outdoors, that they're a hairdressing salon. Um, the CDS kiosk on University Drive was allowing people to get vaccines in the kiosk. Um, the town of Amherst had vaccine tents um, at 70 Boltwood Walk, which is the bank center. Um, there was a new restaurant that opened called Pow Powerhouse Nutrition in the building that used to have Bart's uh, ice cream, and they um, were allowed to have outdoor seating and, and many other things like uh, Savannah's restaurant down on University Drive got a modification of a previously issued special permit. So it's really, um, it's been successful in helping businesses to stay afloat during this difficult time. Uh, one, one of the things that happened recently too was that um, Dragonfly Healthcare on 17 Research Drive, which is Dr. Uh, Kate Atkinson's establishment was allowed to um, construct a new parking area on Research Drive in order to accommodate her patients and also to accommodate the um, more patients that she has now because of, of the pandemic. So um, as I said, it's been very successful. The only thing that we're changing is um, the date. Currently the um, Article 14 was to expire at the end of December of 2021. And given the fact that we have our COVID-19 pandemic um, seems to be continuing, um, we are requesting that it be uh, allowed to continue through December of 2022. So I'm available to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, Andrew, I see your hand. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, you know, I've seen 
a lot of these restaurant sheds in my travels and obviously in town. Um, is there any, I guess, what, what's the downside or have, have people been, are, are, is anybody complaining about these, having these concessions that we need to, to consider? Because to me, this seems like a no brainer. Chris? We, ha we haven't received any complaints about this. Okay, okay. does it impact um, like um, street vendors or something like that, you know, food trucks, whatever? Uh, do people have, or, you know, I guess, like, how many parking spaces have been impacted? I guess, is there a way to quantify any, like, potential harm that we should be considering before we, we think about this? Chris? So it has displaced parking spaces, as you know. Um, we've tried to remedy that to some degree by adding those back in angled parking spaces in front of... Um, near Antonio's. Um, so we're aware of that, but um, we haven't received complaints per se about that. And people seem to really enjoy outdoor, the outdoor dining, um, particularly in the warmer months. But, you know, people are still offering outdoor dining even, even now. It'll probably end, you know, fairly soon. But um, it's, been, it's been an eye opener for all of us. It's also given us some ideas about how we might want to redo the sidewalks in our downtown and um, you know, potentially um, rearrange the parking situation to allow outdoor dining to continue. Um, but as I said, it also relates to other things like you know, med medical institutions and farm stands and um, just, you know, it's, it's been very successful and well-received so far, and I'm not aware of any complaints. Well, I, go ahead, Andrew. I'm sorry, Doug. With just, um, if, uh, just from the restaurant side, if a, if a restaurant is not planning on offering those services in the colder months, are they required to take down their seating? And then would like the Jersey barrier component be adjusted in, in that situation such that we could take those spaces back? The, the parking space is back. Chris? The Jersey barriers will be removed by the DPW just as they were last winter. So all of that um, outdoor dining that's going on in the, uh, in, uh, along the right of way is going to disappear. Um, some of the outdoor dining that is occurring on the sidewalks may remain to the extent that people still enjoy doing that, but um, all of, what's what's currently occurring in the right of way will disappear okay. in, in the roadway i should say yeah thank you uh janet so i i don't i'm wondering um if there's still a need for this um this bylaw amendment because i understood like last when we, in, in fact i proposed that this go longer than the initial proposal because i um, had doctor friends of mine saying this isn't going away quickly, but I feel like, do we need this still, or how long do we need it? Because clearly, the planning board and the ZBA can give permits to new restaurants, um, and you know all the you know that when you do the list of the permanent changes, you know the parking lot we could have done that, um, and things like that. So I just wonder um, why can't the planning board and the ZBA step back into their normal roles? And do that. I can understand why um, I can see next spring the need for outdoor dining, maybe through the summer, but it's hard for me to, for, to see beyond that, the need for that. And so um, I think at some point it's a long-term question for the town council if they want to expand the public, you know, to allow parking spaces to be used for outdoor dining. We already do have outdoor dining on the sidewalks normally. And so it's hard. Do we need this? Do we need, can the planning board and the ZBA just give permits, you know, the way we normally do, um, maybe, for, you know, maybe limiting the scope of this just to outdoor tents or tents at schools, although we have handled tents at schools and we have handled the tent in front of the Jones library and that was very quick. So I, I wasn't sure that, you know, I, I feel like last year we were in uncharted territories and now they're charted and it's not quite as urgent. And so I'm not I'm wondering, is there a need for this to continue, um, you know, past, you know, it ends in December. Does it need to continue maybe past the spring? Okay, thank you, Janet. Chris, do you have a comment on that? I think I've heard from um, the bid 
and the chamber that um, you know this has been really helpful in keeping their businesses going, and um, so they're really promoting having this extension. Um, the building commissioner, I wish he were here, um, found it very successful and you know easy to work with, and it just made life so much easier in the downtown. And I think we can see that our our downtown has really you know become a lively place as a result. And I can't predict when COVID is going to go away and it seems to keep, you know, having a, a lull and then it has a surge. So I think it's, it's hard to predict and allowing this to um, continue through next December, I think is a good idea, but certainly keeping in mind that it is going to end at some point and um, hopefully it'll be ending next December. So I, I would encourage you to keep it going. Um, but that's, that's what I've been hearing around town hall. So is there, right there. I'm sorry, if I can just follow up on that, isn't there a difference between saying, yeah, we'll permit outdoor dining and who gives the permit? Like, oh, the planning board can give the permit for that. So do you know what I'm saying? I mean, yes. we could. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I'm wondering, I, I, I think we need to go one way or the other way eventually. We either need to end this and go back to the usual way of, of, of approving things, or we need to make it permanent. So, but I, I don't mind waiting a year to make that decision. Uh, Jack. Yeah. Um... I think this is no brainer and I was going to move that we approve uh, zoning men as proposed. Okay, thank you, Jack. Uh, anybody want to second that? Uh, Maria, I see your hand up. Um, I'll second, but I'll also add that this isn't just about our dining, it's also the permitting process. It's um, I did a restaurant where they would have had to go through a special permit, but because of Article 14, they were able to just have me work with them directly with the various departments. So it's not just about the sort of temporary situation, but it's also part of this expediting the process. And that's been really helpful for businesses to be able to establish themselves and try to get their feet under them in a less arduous way. So. But yeah, I second Jack's motion. Okay. Uh, Chris, on that note, uh, do you think that this expedited process experience has will result in any long-term changes in how the permitting process happens in town hall? Um, I hope so, but we haven't started to work on that yet. Um, but you can see that some of the... Um, some of the bylaws that we've brought to you, such as the ADU bylaw, did allow more um, authority for the building commissioner to approve certain things without going through the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I think that's going to be really useful. So, you know, it will, the effect of this will spread potentially to other things. But as long as you have, you know, strong criteria in place, I think that these kinds of things can work well. But I wanted to um, also talk about the motion that was made. And I think the motion um, might need to be amended to say that the planning board recommends this uh, extension of article 14 to the town council, because it's the town council that's gonna need to approve it. Um, and you're gonna be recommending it if you choose to do that. Right, so uh, Jack, are you uh, okay with that friendly amendment? Uh, so moved. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Janet. Another, another question I had, um, other than how long, is um, we had talked about a notice requirement um, to notify people by putting a, a note in the window. And I think the CRC agreed to that. Did the town council strip that out? Nope. And it's been do that's been being done. And whenever the uh, restaurateur is not doing it, the uh, inspectors do it. Okay, so so it, it always happens. Okay, so I didn't see that language in this thing, in this one. So 
Uh, I would just wondered if it had sort of disappeared or if I'm just blind. The other, the other issue I think just to highlight is that when people apply for to open a business or a special permit or whatever, is that you know it it's an it's a pot process with a hearing and people can come and talk, and um, I'd, I'd hate to lose that um, part of it. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure applicants we might want to lose it, but I do think it's important that when we have businesses in the community opening or changes in use or expansions that you know the people affected by it or concerned about it have a place to talk and. You know, I, you know, I do think seven heads can often be better than a few heads and things like that. So I don't want to um, lose that 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 part of the process. Okay, thank you, Janet. Um, Chris, I'm not seeing I'm not seeing the language about posting a notice either, and I'm wondering if this is a an old draft, an old draft. Yeah. Okay. So I'll definitely um, get Rob to put forward the the proper draft. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Well, in that case, since we're not looking at what we're actually making the motion about, am I correct that the actual recommendation we're being asked to make is to take, is to recommend that the existing Article 14 be extended by one calendar year? Yes, that's right. Okay. Regar regardless of what Article 14 says. <laughs> Existing Article 14 does include that language okay. that Janet was referring to. Okay. Doug, you're moving us into scary territory, but I, I see it. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, Chris, is that a legacy hand? Yes, sorry. Okay. All right. Let's see how many public participants we still have. Amherst Media and Mara Keen. And I think I know why both of them are here. So, uh, I'm not seeing any hands raised from the public, not seeing any hands raised from the board. Uh, we have a motion, Andrew. So, so what, what is the amended motion? I know we uh, tweaked it when Jack first presented it. What, what are we at now? I, I believe the motion is uh, that, the that the planning board recommend to town council that Article 14 of our bylaw be extended by one calendar year from December 31st, 2021 to December 31st, 2022. Thank you. All right, seeing no hands. Oh, Johanna. my hand is up. Do All we right. also need to close the public hearing at this point as part of the motion? Oh, yes. good, good point. Yep. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And do we need to say that we're in conformance with 11 point whatever or 10 point other things? No. Okay. I haven't yet memorized those numbers. Um, okay. So, so do we all think we're clear on the motion, including Pam, who's taking the minutes? I'm seeing a nodding head. All right. So, Andrew, your your finger. Yeah, sorry, just one more. So, but it's it's the Article 14, the actual article Article 14, which has a language that Janet has yes. referred to now. Thank you. Not what we see in our in our packet. Very good. Okay. Roll call. Maria. Approve. Jack. Approve. Tom. Approve. Andrew. Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So we it's now 9.05 and we've closed this public hearing. All right, next item in the agenda, article number six, old business. Chris, do we have any old business? No old business tonight, no. Nope. No old business. Article seven. Or, or item number seven, new business. No new business, nope. All right, number eight, form A and A&R subdivision applications. No subdivision, no form A's, nope. All right, uh, number nine, upcoming ZBA applications. Nothing new. All right, thank you, Pam. Number 10, upcoming SPP, SPR, and SUB applications. 
Yes, we do have those. Um, we have Wagner Farm, which is on South Northeast Street. Um, it's the Wagner Farm that's on the east side of Northeast Street, and they are proposing to um, install a, a, I think in, in an existing building there, to uh, have a little farm store, which would be like a farm stand. I think it's a class two farm stand, and they would be selling primarily beef that they raise on their property and also other um, farm goods. So they're gonna be coming to you for site plan review for that farm store. And I think that the public hearing for that is going to be um, January 5th. Okay. And then we also have um, John Robleski um, and he was concerned about um, the mixed use building um, bylaw proposal. And um, what he's concerned about is how it will affect his properties at 446 and 462 Main Street. So he's filed a preliminary subdivision plan to freeze the zoning on those properties. Okay. I think that's it. All right. And is he is he likely to uh, ask us to continue that like uh, Archipelago has done? Um, hopefully by January 5th, we will either have the mixed use building bylaw or we won't have it. Okay. I think that the town council expects to vote before the end of the year. Okay. All right, so that's it for item 10. Article <laughs> or number 11, planning board committee and liaison reports. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, Jack. Uh, I have nothing to report, but I am wondering about um, the suggestion that we kind of become a, a lame duck sort of planning board until the new council comes in. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> are you are you are you making the suggestion, or or are you've heard? I I, suggest I that? saw that somewhere. I just was wondering about people's you know reactions. That. Well, I, I'll tell you that both of my legs are working. And I'm walking just fine. <laughs> I can still quack too. <laughs> so I'm I'm still a duck, but not a um, Oh, so, I, I am. That's good news. Okay. Good news. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I think uh, you may have noticed on our agenda that there is no agricultural commission listed. So we've removed that from the agenda. That that uh, commission seems to be out of business for a while, at least. Uh, Andrew, Community Preservation Act Committee. Thanks. Uh, well, I'm glad Doug, you get that time back on your calendar. And I'm <laughs> demanding. Um, It'll we shorten are right our in minutes. Of... Pardon? It'll shorten our minutes significantly. That's true. Um, we're, we're really in the thick of things with CPAC right now. We're, we're getting our presentations done for all of these submissions. Um, I think, I, I, I wanna say there are like 17. We just got an email earlier this week that some of the eligibility may be in question. Um, so we'll be discussing that at our next meeting, which is tomorrow, where we'll have the final of the, the, the final presentations of the applicants. But uh, things are, are moving along well. We've got some pretty cool projects in the works. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll have some good news for you in the next update as to where we stand on some of these things. Okay, great. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad your travel schedule is allowing you to continue do that, doing that. Did, uh, J Janet, what? I was wondering how much money is it in how much money do you have and how many requests, how much money in requests do you have? Uh, so I don't hold me to it. I think we have 1.6 million. Um, there's there, we have money that's available in reserve as well, which we plan on keeping in reserve. I think the total requests, I know they're north of 2 million. I know we have, we have more requested than what we have, but I've not reconciled that against which ones may no longer be eligible. Okay. Great, thanks. Now how about Tom, Design Review Board? No updates this week. 
One one question I had, maybe I should have asked it earlier. Uh, for the signs that might change at the property we reviewed this evening, would those normally be seen by DRB or are they outside of that district? I think they're outside of the district. Okay. All right. I was thinking uh, the same thing, but yeah. Okay. And I think Chris was wagging her head no. Okay. And uh, CRC, Chris? So the CRC met um, on the 16th, which was yesterday, right? And they um, voted to recommend, let me see if I can piece this back together. They voted to recommend um, on a vote of four to one, some of the zoning amendments and a vote of three to two to other zoning amendments. So on mixed use buildings, um, they voted they only have five members, so they voted three in favor and two against um, putting forward the mixed use buildings. Um, the people who voted against it were Dorothy Pam and Steve Schreiber. Um, I think Steve was concerned about um, creating buildings that were non-conforming. In other words, previously approved mixed use buildings that would become non-conforming as a result of this new bylaw. Uh, Dorothy was concerned about not having enough um, retail space in the downtown. So those were their um, major concerns. Um, on the parking facility overlay, uh, they voted um, four to one. Um, Dorothy was the dissenting uh, person um, to recommend the parking facility overlay as it was presented so that rather than changing the zoning of the property behind CDS to BG, um, an overlay would be um, installed and a uh, parking garage might be able to go ahead there. Um, and then on the parking um, bylaw, they voted four to one to um, re recommend the parking bylaw. And the parking bylaw is the bylaw that um, says two parking spaces are required for residential uses, except if you can prove, you know, that you don't need to based on this list of criteria. So, so they talked about that and Janet was there and I, I can't remember what else they talked about. Maybe is, she can. Is apartments, where's apartments? Apartments is all, all approved. That was approved by the, um, council? the town council a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Um, what else did they talk about, Janet? I don't remember actually what um that was that was it and then i don't know what they were talking about at the end i can't remember i think that was it so anyway they they voted to recommend all three of those um but one of them had you know a really mixed vote mm -hmm. great and and i can further report this is not really having to do with community resources committee but the town council hopes to take up um all of the zoning amendments except for the moratorium on November 29th. And by moratorium, you mean the solar array the moratorium? The solar array moratorium, yeah. Right, which will come to us at the beginning of December. That will come to the planning board on December 1st, but it probably won't go to CRC until in January. Right, and you have emailed a copy of that to all of us. Yep. And I guess this would be a good time for me to say, um, I need to get with Chris and, and work out exact dates, but I'm hope, hoping uh, that you guys can look at this and submit questions about it to Chris, uh, you know, several days in advance of our hearing so that we enter the hearing with Chris prepared to give answers uh, to the questions that people have raised. I think that might uh, help expedite the hearing of this. So um, Chris, you and I need to find a time to talk maybe tomorrow or Friday. Okay. Um, Janet, you have your hand raised? So the purpose of the public hearing is for the public to hear about the solar array amendment yeah. and we haven't discussed it yet. Right. But by noticing the hearing, that means that it will apply to the permit that is pending. Is that right? Any changes later? Um, 
So we need to, so we've notif noticed the hearing. And the hearing starts on December 1st. You can continue it after that if you haven't reached, reached a conclusion. Um, but that means that um, the solar array that is currently being proposed would be subject to the moratorium if the moratorium goes into effect. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, and then we have no hearing, we have no discussion before the public hearing for the, okay. Right. Not unless we all get together somewhere else and, and have a notice about it. Um, I assume you're finished, Janet. Johanna? Doug, the questions that you've asked us to prepare, would those be questions specific to the moratorium or specific to a proposed bylaw that the town would then potentially pursue? So um, Chris emailed us what I believe is the text of the bylaw that is proposed. And, and basically it says, you know, any application for a large solar array shall be delayed or not acted on for 18 months or whatever it is. So it's, it's kind of like this article 14 that we've just talked about with the COVID response uh, in that this is sort of a temporary bylaw that just, and you know, it's also not that different from the moratorium that was uh, discussed for downtown new buildings. So it has a time limit on it and then it expires. Um, so, but we wouldn't be, we'll be talking about the, the moratorium proposal, but because this is a, this is a, a development of a type we don't, we haven't dealt with very much as a board. You know, this isn't a building, this isn't a, a duplex apartment on the, you know, the RG district or something. Um, you know, I think when I started to think about this, I had basic questions about, you know, how is the Conservation Commission involved? What article of our zoning bylaw even applies to solar arrays? Um, you know, um, if it's not the Conservation Commission, what's our role as opposed to the Zoning Board of Appeals? Um, and so, you know, I think I think we we should use this as an education, an opportunity to educate ourselves about solar arrays in 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 our under our bylaws and how they're treated, who gets a say, you know, are there are there gaps in the current process we have, which seems to be the part of the rationale for this moratorium that we don't have adequate. Uh, regulation of these developments. Um, you know, it might be useful for us to kind of remind ourselves or even have a couple of site visits of existing solar arrays that have been built in Amherst recently. Um, so, you know, those are the kinds of things that went through my head. Obviously, you know, people will have more questions, not only us, but the public in the hearing, however long it goes. But I just thought this is one that we probably ought to think about our questions just to, you know, not show up with a whole bunch of questions and automatically have to continue the hearing. Uh, Chris. So, um, I just wanted to say that it's um, we do have a way of managing solar arrays now. Um, they're treated as energy generating facilities and they require um, special permits from the Zoning Board of Appeals in almost all the zoning districts. I think there's one zoning district where, where that's not required. And, and that's worked pretty well, um, but we've never had a solar array proposed that was as big as the one that is currently being proposed. And the other thing is that we've never had one that is um, that requires 
as much um, cutting of trees. And I think those are things that have concerned people about this particular solar array. We have had big ones in the past, like the one at Hampshire College, uh, which is visible from the street, but that didn't require um, any tree cutting, I don't think. And there are other ones uh, sort of scattered around town. So I think this brought up a lot of questions to people. Um, but other questions that have to be resolved are things like um, how much uh, carbon sequestration does you know, a certain amount of land, a forested land um, provide? And then, you know, how do you balance that off against um, the carbon that would not be emitted into the atmosphere by having X number of acres of a solar array? And those are things that we don't have any answers to. We don't, um, neither the planning board nor the conservation commission is schooled in this topic. So um, we may need at some point for the town to, you know, hire somebody to help us to sort this out. Um, but for right now, what we're being asked to do is to place a moratorium on large scale solar arrays, which actually aren't that large. They're, um, I think that 250 kilowatts is what is uh, proposed and that would be about an acre of land, I think. Um, so that would be what would be considered large scale based on our moratorium. And um, the one that is being proposed up in Northeast Amherst is like 44 acres. So one acre versus 44 acres. Uh, I think they're, the one that's being proposed is 11 megawatts. And you know, it's possible that Johanna knows more about this because I know she's in that, she's in that business or that the business of understanding these things. But um, anyway, the, the scale of this thing that's being proposed is much bigger than what we have seen in the past. Um, but no, nevertheless, the town does have a, a way in place of dealing with these things, but we don't call it a solar bylaw. So now we're thinking that maybe we do need a solar bylaw. And maybe the solar bylaw says things like, you can't clear more than X number of acres in order to have a solar array. So these are all things that we need to think about. And Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has published a document that is um, guidelines to help its member communities figure out how to deal with these things. Belchertown has a, a bylaw in place that they put in place in 2019 that looks, you know, it's pretty simple, but it looks reasonable. And um, some people in town who aren't, well, uh, they're not staff members, but they're members of the public are working on a bylaw. So there's a lot of activity and thought around this. Um, and a lot of pluses and minuses to whether we want to have a moratorium or not, but we can we can talk about that on the first. But please right. send me your questions based on what you've received, and I will try to get answers for them. Right. Thanks, Chris. So we are we're we're not going to be deliberating tonight just because we haven't advertised this as a topic. So, mm -hmm. but we did want to just introduce the fact that we will be talking about this. Jack. You just took the wind out of my sails there, Doug. Um, <laughs> but you're, I, well, you're welcome, Jack. <laughs> but I, 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 I thought, you know, Chris, you know, again, uh, everything she uh, mentioned was was on my mind. You know, does Johanna have uh, some expertise that she can share, like now, just to kind of give us a heads up? Is this up her alley, or should we hire? Uh, you know, uh, some, you know, professional peer, you know, review on this to help us because this whole thing with, you know, cutting trees down and, you know, versus the, the, the clean energy of, of the solar panels, it's, it's vexing and, and it's disturbing. And it, it'd be nice to just, someone, you know, can deal someone, with that. Someone from more than 50 miles away, right? Maybe that's, that's the definition <laughs> of, an, of an expert. <laughs> so that yeah, that's all I had to say. But yeah, you know, Chris and yeah. Okay, Janet. I'm I'm not sure where we are on the agenda, but um, well, we're we're on uh, Christine Brestrup on the CRC report. Oh, okay. Because so I was going, I had a question for um report of staff section, so. 
Okay. All right, Chris, I assume you're done with CRC. All right, report of chair. I don't have anything to report this evening. I, I, I Jack, you'll have to tell me what I'm what I'm missing. I need what what it is I'm supposed to report in this section. I have had a hard time finding anything to say. Uh, you, you'll want to kind of like you know speak to you know your next uh, backyard gathering. So. Oh, okay, well, that'll be <laughs> some, some, sometime in the spring. It's okay. But you know, the holidays are coming. So all right. Well, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Put a tent right. on the street. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so next is report of staff. Chris, it's, would you start? And it sounded like Janet wanted to ask you something too at the end. So I want to celebrate the fact that Pam has become a grandmother. Oh. Her daughter had a baby daughter. And I think it happened last Thursday. And so Pam's been a grandmother for almost a week. And she doesn't look a bit older than she did last Thursday. And the baby has come home. The mother and the baby have come home and they are healthy. And Pam is on cloud nine. Pam, <laughs> welcome to the, the, the grandparent club. That's pretty awesome. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Lots, lots of grand pooches, but um, <laughs> yeah, this is my youngest daughter. So this is my baby. baby. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. Very nice. Yeah. Happy news. Okay. Janet, did you want to ask something at this point? Um, I had just a question about the RFP for the design, design consultant. I don't know if they're going to be for downtown or what, but um, I, is that going to be like when's that happening? Because I'm very eager for that process to start or to see the RFP and things like that. So I've asked Nate to draft an RFP, and he's very good at drafting RFPs. He's done it a lot, so um, he's working on that. He's uh, reached out to other planners around the state, and um, he's going to be putting that together. So Excellent. we're hoping that we can kind of get that off the ground in 2022. Great. Oh, and I could also, I could make another report too, which is that um, we're still working on their flood maps. And we recently put out a press release saying that the uh, appeal period for the flood maps is coming to a close in early December. We're hoping that that, you know, wraps it up. Um, what happens after that is that FEMA takes about 60 days to do whatever they do. And then they come forth with a letter to us um, and we, we expect that the letter might uh, appear in March, come back to us presenting, um, what do they call it, a letter of final determination. And then we have six months after that to adopt the flood maps and adopt um, text to go along with the flood maps, which would go into the zoning bylaw, and to adopt a um, flood flood insurance study, which is a, a text that describes what this is all about. So this is a project we've been working on since 2012, and we're hoping to wrap it up in 2022. <laughs> wow. um, that is something that's going to be coming along, and you will be reviewing the, um, the flood map text. All right. So is that fast for this kind of project? I normally towns don't initiate this for themselves. There were a number of reasons why Amherst decided to initiate this process for themselves. Um, but meanwhile, while we were doing this, there's another group of um, consultants actually connected to our consultants who are examining um, part of the Connecticut River watershed. And, and we're actually included in that. So our study even though we paid for it ourselves, will be included in their study. So it happens that it's it's you know it's coming along at the right time. Um, and anyway, you, you'll hear hear more about that starting in January. Okay, thanks. All right, anything else from anyone? All right, time is nine thirty, and we can adjourn. Thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all.